there's not really a great deal wrong with it in all honesty there's quite a lot of paint flaking on the on the casings and especially on the actual engine i'll say we're halfway probably that is it finished well finished <laughs> barely started this is a clean up a practical clean up that anyone i would say can tackle this just ain't good enough so i bought the special tools i don't have the special tool to get these nuts off completely out of my comfort zone with this can't believe how easily this bike came apart beautiful beautiful on the bike beautiful on the bike car oh, baby i can imagine people around the world screaming at their computers for me to stop years serviced and reassembled these have been ported by bigelow performance so the heads are now also coated. can we pop them in there let them soak take it to a professional you don't know what you're doing <laughs> so if you don't know nelly he's got his own youtube channel called desmo works i'd like to see he got the same special tools as i've got Welcome back to the channel guys and welcome back to Nelly's Garage because it's happened finally after two years. Back to building the engine. We're back to putting the Hyper engine back together. So we're back at Nelly's, the engine building, builder extraordinaire. Now if you cast your minds back, obviously there's a lot of people new to the channel since we did this. So I'm going to put links to the previous Hyper Motard restoration build at the top. And uh, today we're all about putting the engine back together. We'll talk you through some of the things which have been done to the engine because it's not going to be standard. It's had ported heads and whatnot. But we'll talk you through that as we assemble it and basically see how far we get today. Yeah. Putting the engine back together. And if I've still got everything because I've moved house since we've done this. Nelly's had bits hanging around in his garage yeah. for two years. So <laughs> it could be we're missing some vital components, but I think we've got it all. Fingers crossed. We'll Fingers be there. crossed we've yeah. got it all. So uh, if that sounds of interest, grab yourself a cuppa and chopsy. Roll the intro. So Nelly's had a little bit of a reorganisation since we were last here. We now have an incredible fancy Draper tool set. Did you have the ramp before? I think you yeah, did. Yeah, the ramp was there before, yeah. Track bike, cupboards, and you've also got now a blasting uh, cabinet Vapor as well. blaster. Vapor just, blaster. Yeah, I just need to sort out decent um, air compressor to support it now. The crank's been balanced, so that's been to Andrew's engineering. He does like a special sort of Ducati balance. It's, it's a bit... Uh, yeah, he's a dynamic balancer and he sort of specialises in... Um, well, Ducati's is one of the areas he specialises in, so I've always referred people to him yeah. and used him myself as well. well when I went up to him and had a chat with him and he's an old, old fella isn't he? Yeah. And he, you know, he knows his stuff. And it's really interesting what he was saying about the Ducati cranks is that they use a really good metal. He said there's nothing wrong with the metal in the Ducati cranks but they do a piss poor job of actually balancing them. They, they're better, they're better than they were but like the early, the early two valve engines, the early Desma Quattros and even some of the early Tester Strettas, there was massive benefits to be found by oh, really? dynamically yeah. balancing them. The, late, the later engines like the Panigales and that apparently are much, much better. Yeah. So, What's the, uh, what's the main advantage? To, it's not a performance thing, it's just uh, um, longevity. Well, there is, a, there is a little it? bit of performance benefit. You're taking a little bit of weight out, obviously, yeah. um, and depending on what you do with them. So, uh, so people that do Japanese bikes like to knife edge their cranks yeah, so it that. reduces windage in their crank cases so you get some benefit from that so you reduce some of the resistance to spinning it up apparently um, but having it dynamically balanced just means that you're removing any unnecessary vibrations within the engine that could could over the long term do damage yeah i mean if it's really badly balanced in the short term you would do damage but um, you're just improving upon that manufacturer balancing which is like you tend to see these little holes that are drilled in the crank webs that some of these might have been added by yeah, Andrew's decisions, but maybe, yeah. you can either, on some cranks you can have weight added back in or you can have it back, taken back out, but it just matches your whole rotating assembly to your pistons and your you can com see rods. He's taken a little bit yeah. out of the back bottom of the... You can see some bits and pieces done there and he might have just taken some weight off of your pistons, etc., just so that they're 
they're within like i think it'll probably get them to be perfectly matched but certainly within at least a, a gram at the, you know or an ounce or whatever it is i can't remember which way around it is but you know you you're taking away any variation in the balancing so you get as smooth a you know as smooth as a v-twin can be obviously yeah. you get as smooth as an engine i guess, I guess that saves bearing wear and yeah, that sort of thing yeah. as well doesn't it and you can see on here where he's taken weight off of the the web oh, yeah. I'm the so that's there. there's just obviously he'll find where the imbalancing is with a special machine that he uses and then machines it out or counterweights it in another area just to balance that off it's like christmas isn't it it is indeed <laughs> my favorite kind of christmas it's ducati parts bike bits yeah so that's uh, one of the crank oh. cases which which are all sarah coated as well so they've all been set. so there's been no expense spared so far actually in this yeah. uh, in this build and again it looks pretty clean inside because the issue is isn't it is it's all about the blasting isn't it because yeah. you don't you don't want media don't want media inside. less than that and even if it's blasted, it still sort of sticks to it, doesn't it? Yeah, and yeah. Vapor blasting is so much better because it doesn't impinge into the, the the problem with a lot of motorcycle engines well, and, and modern car engines because they're aluminium. If you have somebody that uses a really aggressive dry media, it yeah. can impinge. And then also, no matter how good they are at cleaning it, it just sits in places in the engine yeah. and then vibrates its way loose and damages your engine. But Vapor blasting is so much better because it's it, the media is in a water, it tends to run away and not, not build up anywhere, which is why it's preferred when you're doing these sort of things. Oh, and there's the other part. I don't think I've even uh, mated those together. Just making sure that we've got all the bits. Yeah. So that's that. Well, we, we definitely got two pistons of crank and cement casing, <laughs> we know that much. We're part way there. We're part way there. Ah, the gear set. Gear set. Not seen a lighting day in two years. Yeah. Select your drum. There's your oil pump. Sump plug. Indent spring. Strainer. I should have got a new strainer and all that, shouldn't I? I guess after its first run, it's probably best to change the oil. Yeah. And then change the strainers and everything then, I guess, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. If I'm going to do it. When was the last time you put one of these together? A two valve would uh, would be my bike. Yeah. Oh really? How long ago was that? Uh, three years ago. Was it? I ten. I obviously I do four valves most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. But the the bottom ends are identical. That one. Ah yes. Is that the one. That is the one. Three. So that's all the bearings there. We've got them all. Should be. Is that should be doubled up on one of those. Because I think these are the later bearings or something. Or yeah, single bearings. single piece. So um, now there's good news and bad news about these. These are not oh, yeah. very popular because oh. they um, they have a higher failure rate than the old ones. So basically, the old bearings used to sit inside a separate housing. Okay. Whereas these are all one piece now. Okay. Um, and I think it was from the eight four eight onwards. That they started doing that, but also that piece. Yeah. yeah, that coincided with a lot of failures as well. Yeah. But I think, like anything, it's how you look after the bike more yeah, than. Yeah, um, well, the balance crank went out as well, wasn't it? Yeah. And then he's still got the Lotus as well. Look at that beauty. Lotus Esprit. It's a V8 Turbo, this one, isn't it? Is it a V8? V8 Twin Turbo. V8 Twin Turbo. Yeah. Has it been around in Nuremberg? I see you got the little. Oh, yes, it on. has indeed. Indeed, it has. Yeah, that's, that's Nelly's next project. So Nelly does have his own YouTube channel. Desmo works. Is that going to be something on the channel at one point? Yeah, I will do, yeah. Just from an engineering interest point of view. Right, so just getting the bearings ready to pop out. So yeah. um, like on the gearbox output shaft, you have this sort of retaining clip. Oh, yeah, yeah. With two count. These can be a bit of a pain to get out. Can they? They can tend to shred, so we've got to be a bit careful on these. You've got then two little 10 mil bolts with securing collars for the other one. And then just some standard circlips on the intermediate yeah, yeah, timing yeah. shaft location. All the rest are just interference fits. So these will just, we'll put a little bit of heat in and then pop them out. Oh, well, bearings out in with the new. Yeah. First job. That's the new. Let's get the cases ready to put together, basically. Well, this will do just by heating around the um, bolt a little bit. If there's any 
Loctite input in there, it just softens it up. Yeah. I've had to drill these out a fair few Have times, you? yeah. It's not a, not a pretty job. So what I tend to do is just apply a little bit of force tightening them and then go the other, there we go. See. Okay. Is there any more like that or is that the only No, two? it's just those two. Bang, you got it. A little bit of force to overcome there. Yeah. That was the sort of, that little ping you heard, was it? suddenly releasing its stiction. Now it's just like lovely smooth action down. Just pushing through. Yeah. There we go. Oh, hey. So the old bearings are now out. We're now ready to fit the new ones. I mean the reason, I don't know if we've explained, but the reason you leave the old bearings in before why you have the casings prepped is of course you don't want this mating edge between the casings and the bearing to get damaged by any sort of blast media or, or whatever. So it's always better to blast your casings with the bearings yeah. in them and then take them out once the Save, once the save that done. face. You don't want to, because their interference fits the bearings. So you don't want to wear it away at all, even if it is minor. And vapor blasting is much, much more forgiving than normal blasting, but yeah. even so it still takes material away. Right, we need to go do some bearing cooking. <laughs> or freezing. <laughs> so let into me... the freezer. Get some ice cream while you're in there, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Frozen deliveries. <laughs> so top tip, always labelled, stick them out so you can always read it again if you're yeah. helping another engine builder out. Fully seated. Is that one? Just checking it's fully seated. I just noticed there's a bit of grit on there. Missed a bit. Just clean that away. There's a seal that goes there, but we're dead. Good. I've just got to put circle it back in on that one. Oh, okay. It feels nicer than the old one. Tap it home, just to make sure, sure it's definitely yeah. home. So okay. Looks good. It's engaging. Enough pressure to seat it, but not enough to damage it. Just double check that by hitting on it and make sure it rings. Yeah. Nicely. Sure it sounds proper. Yeah, like that. There She's ringing right. So bearings all refitted to the casings. Bit stressful getting those in, but they're all in nicely. We've got a bit of nice free movement on them now, so that's that's ready to go. The comrades tell us they're bees, um, and in the manual, to get the correct starting point, you've got to match. But we can't find a letter. On the crank, there is in paint a 13A, so I think we might be an A, but usually it's stamped, but there's nothing in it um, on these ones. I've got a horrible feeling. It might have been where it was balanced. <laughs> it might have been where it was balanced. We got an A, B, we should be blue and blue. Just double check, we are definitely blue, 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 blue. And we can hopefully, we're lucky, mm, we're not. Sometimes the paint mark stays on the original shells, but it's worn away on these ones. It would have been nice if we'd have seen some blue on there just to reinforce that decision. What we're going to do is we're going to plastic gauge check the clearance between the Comrod shell bearings and the crankshaft journal pin, um, and we do that with plastic gauge that give us a measured clearance. So we get like a little small strand of that. We'll put it on each of the comrods as we tighten them down. And then after it squishes, you get this comparative gauge. And we've got a limit of 0 to 0 0.016. So we should be, uh, that sounds very small. 
I'm looking at the wrong side, am I? No, that wouldn't work. Hang on a second, this don't make sense. Slight, slight issue. We, we haven't got the right plastic gauge. Right plastic gauge is missing. <laughs> yeah, so most, most of the rest of the Ducati engines use the red plastic gauge, but it looks like the Hyper Motard 1100 engines need the green plastic gauge, which I used to have, but got wet, so threw it away and never replaced it because I wasn't using it. Yeah. And it's a Sunday. Shortcoming. And it's a Sunday so and we, we can't, can't find it. it. So we've got to order some. So we're not going to be able to finish the engine today. It's not all going to be in one video. So what we're going to do is what we can do, which is what's this? We're going to shim the cases now just shim to make sure that the crankshaft is shimmed correctly, get the gearbox shimmed. Um, but we can't bolt it all together yeah. because we've still got to do the oil clearance for the com rods com and the rods. crankshaft. So we'll have to come back and do that. Come so back and do that. It's going to be a two-parter. Yep. What are we doing now? So just going to strip the crankshaft down so that I can get it into the engine and we are going to shim the cases so um, I'll get them out in a second but you've got a pair of spacers for the crankshaft and then on the gearbox as well there's a set of right. shims that go on so I said called them spacers shims are for the crankshaft and then you've got shims for the gearbox we're going to set those up so it's correct so that once we get the oil clearance done we'll be ready to bolt Let's the bolt cases back in. together now with this being balanced it's got to go back in the same way each time but it's on a set of keyways so it won't be a problem for us to take it apart oh, there's the key there look. so so why do you have to do the tolerance on how it all it's not like a silly question yeah so no no no, just bolt no. It together so this bearing here is a radial and actually loaded bearing right. so you have to apply preload to it so oh. you have to push that in basically that that center race that's done by having these shims that the crank will push against when the cases are bolted together and that will load up your bearing right. so it doesn't float basically then the gearbox bearings they have a certain amount of float in them so they can move up and you know, or they can move actually, but not radially. Obviously, the radially they're held in by the bearings, but they have a certain amount of float actually, whereas the crankshaft is locked in. Right. So that's that's what we're effectively right, going to be okay. measuring. So I'm just going to see what we're used to having. Now 2.25 each side. So so there was 4.5 worth of shims in there. What we what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a set of two two mil ones. We'll drop it in, check how much movement it's got. Yeah. And then you need to preload it and we'll confirm what the preload is in the manual, but it's usually either 0.1 or 0.3, depending on what, what engine you're doing and how, how loose you want it as a builder. Right. It's all very complicated. Yeah, it's good fun. We know that we've got 4.5 worth of shim there. We're going to put 3.8 in. So if they're correct, we should be getting exactly well, we'll find out what we've got to take off first. If it's 0.3, then we should be seeing about a 0.2, 0.3 movement on the crank. Oh, I'm a bit lost, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Over there, as, you, as you proceed, as we do it, I will understand it should, what we're trying should to achieve. become clear, yeah. yeah. We'll make it clearer. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're home thinking, oh, I don't know what's going on. Right, then. so first, first off, the shims, you'll notice that there's a beveled side and a flat side. The flat side goes against the bearing okay. and the reason for that is obviously you've got a radius on your crankshaft so when you put that on there you need the bevel edge to sit against the yeah makes sense radius so we're just going to drop that in there he says there we go we'll stick that side on there then we need to get the gear cluster it's already got its shims in there so we're using the existing shims so i'm going to leave the shims as is in there and we'll measure what float we've got the selector drum has got a set of shims on it as well and should have a certain amount of float so the challenge we've got is getting that into there and you've got to be careful because you can push these needles oh, out yeah. so you can't use a lot of force and sometimes it pops on straight away, and other so, times you it's a pain in the ass. go backwards and forwards. Aha. Like that. 
So well. sometimes it works perfectly. Well, we're gonna take it back in a minute, unfortunately. <laughs> in layman's terms, you can measure the clearances on the cases. There's a whole load of measurements you can do, which I've done in one of my videos. Um, but what we're gonna do is we've left that loose. Okay, yeah. So what I'm gonna do is bolt the cases together so that they're torqued down correctly. We're gonna then measure how much movement there is. Right, we, do. we can then work out that movement right. and add the preload to it. And then taking away the shims that I've got in there at the moment will give us how much extra shim we need to preload it. I see. And then for the gearbox, we're just checking what floats in there because it's supposed to be a certain amount of float. It's a nice, nice bit of action now, like that. Yeah. We would have pistons going up yeah. and down if we'd have done that <laughs> bit of it, but alas. Well, Alas. Next, you're going to have to wait till next time, guys, yeah. to see that. The bolt with the brown bit on it is actually an oil bolt. There's a hole through the centre ah, of it. Okay. It's very important that that goes, goes in the in correct the right place, place. Yeah. which is here. What does that feed through to then? Uh, it just allows the oil passage, so it goes through to the crank right. and the, up to the heads, etc. So it's making sure that you've got the correct bolt in there. Mm. I'll just clean the thread first. Just want to make sure that we've not got any dirt in there. Yeah, absolutely. Last thing is you want it. Um, That's the sort of the place you're going to get. Yeah. Any media left stuck in there. Yeah. You? They're blind holes. Yeah, you can just feel a little bit of grip. Yeah, a little bit of grip. Yeah. Resistance. Not much else. It's like every now and then there's a little bit of grip resistance. There, there you go. That's better. I feel bad, is it? Yeah. <laughs> That's what it should have done before. And there we go. And then there's two on the other side, so we just need to spin it over. Spin the cases over. And we know the threads are nice and clean. <laughs> we, <laughs> we've, we've just done it. We've chased them down. Uh, talk, 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 talk. So there we go. 19 first stage. And then. Oh, so tighten them all up to 19, yeah. and then tighten them all up to 25. Okay. Now, this drilled screw has its own torque setting. You only oh, go to okay. 18 newton meters on that, oh, okay. and we'll do that last. 25 now. That's the one with the, the oil way through yeah. it. And I hate this one. There we go. So I'm just using this as a magnetic base because obviously it's an aluminium block. So basically, I've gone with smaller shims than what we had so yeah. I need to work out what movement there is because I need to take account of that movement and then add preload in the right. thickness of these. So I've put some loose ones in so I can move that up and down and measure how much movement it's got. Yeah. And then I'm going to eliminate that movement by preloading the crank. Forcing the crank up so you can see, you might be able to make out the movement, but you can certainly see it on the dial gauge. Yeah. I'm getting about 0.3 movement. Just zero that again. Yeah, just just shy of point three. We're forcing the crank against the bearing. So we got point three. We'll work out what the preload is shortly. And then we so we need to add in at least point three on here, but I'll also then have to add in the preload, preload difference as well. Let's see. Let's see. Right now, I need to just work out how much float we've got on the gearbox shafts. So these should have a float on them. So these aren't preloaded. They should just have a certain amount of clearance. And that's, you would shim that then to achieve that yeah. clearance. If this is There's right. very limited shimming available for the gearbox shafts. Right, okay. So it's, it's a case of best fit. You know you've got good bearings in there yeah. and it's playing around with the shims to get the best fit. But actually they only have two sizes of each shim. Oh, Where, whereas with a the crank, there's low, there's about 10 different sizes for the gearboxes and that there's not there's not a great deal of right. selection with the transmission so we should be anywhere between 0.1 and 0.4 so if i just zero that we're point just over 0.3 so we're within service limits right. on that one so now we're on the um clutch output shaft when that's on the tight side, so that's 0.1, but that's, I mean, it's in the tight end of the spec. 
Um, and now I need to check the shift drum. Okay, I'm just going to lift that up then. And again, we've shift got drum. point two four. And what was it again? The service. So it has to be between point one and point four. Um, they'd rather it was closer towards the point four. So at point two four, we're bob on. Yeah, brilliant. Really nice position. Cool. Excellent. Not too many false neutrals, hopefully. Hopefully so. It is a Ducati after all. It might get a few. <laughs> <laughs> Not after I've built the engine. No, Not after no, no, I've built no, no, the no. engine. We'll pop it apart. Yeah. Just double check the shims. We've got to add in 0.6 or the closest to 0.6. So if it ends up like being 0.5 or yeah. 0.55, we'll still have at least 0.2 worth of preload. But we'll see how close we can get because we don't want to go over. We don't want to over preload it. Right, okay. So we've checked the float on the gearboxes, all within yeah. service limits, 0.1 to 0.4 on the main gearbox output, obviously the clutch output, which is on the other side of this cluster, and we checked the gear selector drum clearance. Yeah. And then I put smaller crank shims in, so these were 1.9 each, and we had a float of 0.3, but we need to apply a 0.3 preload to the bearings as well. So I need to take these out, and just check the measurement is definitely what I think it is. Yeah. Which is 1.9, 1.9. So we've got 3.8 millimeters of shim yeah. and we need to add 0.6. So we need 4.4 millimeters worth of shim. Now I think the originals were close to that. Let's just check 2.25. And why does it differ? Just different. because the way the bearings have might not be slightly different locations or? Yeah, um, marginally thicker bearings, slightly different location, slightly different size on the ball race yeah. and the chrome that might be sat on them as well. So um, variables, sort of a whole load of variables. So actually we're, we're over shimmed at the moment. So that is currently, that's 4.5. Yeah. We need 4.4. So I need to find two 2.2s, two right. um, which hopefully I've got some in my selection. So I've got 4.4 versus, which hopefully should be 3.8. 3.8 so that is our correct shim size okay so we've had to come down a little bit the come down a little bit from the new bearings from going the new in bearings, right. so all good on that front the cases are ready to be bolted together we just now need to do the plastic gauge when i get some new plastic gauge in <laughs> green <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there we go that's all we can do in this episode until we get the new plastic gauge in we get that and then do you reckon we're halfway through, do you reckon? Uh, yeah, we're at the halfway point, because the point. plastic aging will take us about 20 minutes to do, because right. ho hopefully we've got the right shims, uh, sorry, the right bearings, yeah, so it'll be a case of yeah. confirm the oil clearance. Once the oil clearance is confirmed, we'll then tighten on the uh, comrods correctly to the crankshaft, and then we'll bolt the cases together, because we're already pre-shimmed now, yeah, we know so correctly just, what's going on. Go so it'll that. be doing the gloop around, stick them on, and then it'll be top end build. So the next the next video will be pretty, pretty intense amount of work, but actually it will look busy, but from our point of view, it'll take less time than we've spent we've today done. doing all this preparatory work for the cases. Oh, brilliant. So if you like the sound of that, you know what you've got to do, press subscribe. Also, don't forget, check out Nelly's channel. I'll put links to Nelly's channel in the description and also on the screen so and you've got a lot of these builds documented on yeah the channel, yeah haven't yeah, you as well? yeah not as chaotic as this because <laughs> all, all the other engines use red plastic gauge <laughs> <laughs> that's what we need for the green we need yeah it? yeah we need green. <laughs> so thanks for watching guys and we'll see you don't worry it won't be another two years until no, the next video no. comes out it'll be out very very soon cheers guys see you later i won't give any technical details i'll leave that to nelly that's bob on the 20. Good luck finding that. Yeah, the robots do it really quick. Yeah. I am a robot. We'll do that. We'll do a sugar this tea. We'll <laughs> do that whole day, innit? <laughs> oh, <don't miss> <laughs>